The doctor is in the house. The doctor's in, and he's looking good. He's looking I refreshed. I, you know what? I need it. You told me last time I was on fat mascara that you'd provide hair and makeup for me. So this time <laughs> I had to do it myself. You, know, you yeah. look good. I don't I know if everyone good. knows here, but you you battled COVID. Like it's been almost a month. It's like day twenty seven, day twenty eight, and without going into detail, it was like two weeks of the most horrific time of my life physically and emotionally and I feel so much better but you know you hit that wall of frustration where it's like I've been sick for a month I'm ready for work I'm ready for exercise I want soul cycle uh and the fact of the matter is my body just can't do it I'm like at 50 percent I nap a lot I still get a little fear and frustration if I get yeah. up too quickly I breathe heavily I'm gonna be okay but you know you're screening out all this stuff that's going like, on you know it sounds cliche we're all in this together but we are all yeah, in this together we are. where are we right now like in the u.s well i i think right now the good news is we're all seeing response there's no question that the efforts we're making with masks and staying home it works and when mm -hmm. we stop doing it it'll stop working but we're starting to like talk about things like when are we going to go back to life so Okay, like it's beautiful out right now. It kind of, I feel a little bit like tricked into thinking, okay, like we're, you know, this is the light at the end of the tunnel. In a couple yeah. of weeks, we're all going to be out having yeah. brunch, going to the gym. We're, you don't think we're anywhere close? There's nowhere close. Well, first of all, it's going to be a very staged thing. It's not going to be a light switch. You know, it's going to be six, six to nine months overall. But that doesn't mean that we're not going to get back to life. It's just going to be staged. You know, my like office, tears. yeah, I mean, my office will probably be 50% capacity. No one wants to sit in a busy rate waiting room. You know what yeah. I mean? Mm -hmm. um, I think if you go and get your hair done, if you go to a restaurant, I mean, I don't think theater or large engagements or concerts are going to happen to the fall. Yeah. You know, I think retail stores are going to have different rules of how many people they let in the doors. Wow. You know, you have to adjust to the new norm. Obviously, we want we want to all get back to life, but we want to do it safely. When we do go back to life. Those numbers are going to tick up again. No matter what we do, there are going to be people that are going to keep getting sick. What we have to do is find that balance, you know? So. Okay, so. Let's, let's get to beauty. Okay, 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 okay. So you, what I'm really excited, you know, normally, like, when we have people on Fat Mascara or, you know, just like when we talk to them, we're not about, like, let's talk about your latest project. We just want to talk yeah. about them as people. Yeah. But I'm actually really excited about something you have coming out early this summer. Yeah. You have a book coming out. But it's not like a boring, like, you know, like skincare guide. It's something that I think is quite revolutionary. You're calling it the pro aging playbook. I think yeah. it takes huge balls for a cosmetic dermatologist <laughs> to call something a pro aging yeah. playbook. What does pro aging mean? And is that like, wh what does that mean? Pro aging? Well, it's more of a punch in the face to You make all your money by anti-aging. I know. Well, that's the thing. And unfortunately, it's like a punch in the face to anti-aging. Because even when I was in training, it was all about like making us look younger. Having us be something that we're not so battling you something. your book already. Thank you. Oh, oh. H H. Wow. Okay. Thank you. No, but <laughs> but it, it comes with this predetermined notion that aging is a bad thing, and that if you don't anti-age, you're going to be like left out of the job world, left out of the intimacy world, and all these different things. And I think that's what the culture of beautification, whether it's been hair, makeup, skincare, cosmetic surgery, I think that's what it's been about for generations. And I think now, not only because of technology, but because yeah. of the societal acceptance that grooming, um, you know, youthful modification, rejuvenation mm -hmm. is just so accepted. And it's across all socioeconomic classes that we could talk about it. It's, it's about an attitude more than anything else. And the pro-aging playbook um, is really about you get out of aging what you put into it. And, you know, it's, it's all a battle. It ain't easy getting old. It ain't easy dealing with pandemics. But it's certainly true that your attitude going in and your perspective is going to really have a huge impact on how you feel about yourself. And that's what aging should be about. So is it like if you're going in, like when if a patient comes into you and they're like, um, you know, I'm, I'm 45 and like, you know, I want to look like they show you a picture of the, how they look like they were 35. Yeah. What is that conversation? I mean, that must happen all the time. Well, I always tell people, you know, I can't inject a smile. I can't inject a smile and there really is no objectivity in beauty. Um, you know, vanity is actually a sign of health. I can tell you that during those two weeks, even I didn't care about what I looked when I was what I looked mm -hmm. like. You know, vanity is a blessing to care about how you look to groom yourself. 
And, um, you know, I, I, I think people have to realize that there are beautiful people that feel ugly and there are people that aren't objectively beautiful that feel great about themselves. So that's a lot of the conversation I have with people. I try and find out what their goals are, find out what their expectations are, and to some degree, not only treat them with my expertise, but to give them guidance through everything from wellness, the way they eat, the way they live their life, mm -hmm. and to help them. I mean, I wanted to become a psychiatrist before a dermatologist, so I don't know what that means about my own sense of uh, vanity and insecurity. But. but it really is. I mean, this sounds like such a cliche, but like looking the best at um, the best at every age. Like, you know, yeah. so if you're 45, you're 65, whatever it is. It's looking Well, you said you can't inject a smile, which is really nice. But like, you know, being being the, the best at the age you are, not necessarily yeah. trying to turn the clock back. Yeah, it's the best version of you. Everyone has their good hair day. I don't care if they're a Harley Davidson uh, truck driver. I don't care if they're a beauty editor. Everyone has that good hair day in the mirror. It's because no one is beyond, you know, feeling good about themselves. And whether we like it or not, the, the visual feedback we have in the mirror does play a role in how we treat ourselves. And how we treat ourselves affects the way other people treat us. But you after know? this, what do you think is going to, what do you think with the aesthetics industry, what do you think we're going to see? Do you think people are going to go right back and say, give me my Botox? Or do you think people are going to say, actually, it doesn't matter as much? No, I actually think business <laughs> is going to be booming. I really do. And it's, and again, for no other reason is that people want to feel good. They want to feel good about themselves. And I think the stigma of wanting to look good for yourself, to look well-groomed, to color your hair. I mean, people used to be embarrassed. They used to, in the 1930s when hair color came out, they used to get their hair colored in the basement because right. it was taboo. You know what I mean? Yeah. Now you have, you have millennials getting Botox, people getting hair laser, treating their acne scars, treating sweating under the arms. The stigma has gone. And once the stigma has gone, there's nothing wrong with these things. And that's true of whether they're shopping for makeup, you know, mm -hmm. the lipstick effect we always talk about, yeah. or getting Botox. So I do believe business will come back voraciously. I think there are going to be socioeconomic factors for everybody, not just dermatologists, but the Sephora's and the Ulta's and the Estee Lauder's. You know, I think there's going to be a re-strategizing about how to deal with the customer. And I think this is a great conversation to have. Like, what is going to come of the beauty industry? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's going to shift dramatically. You know, I've always been as, of the mindset as a dermatologist, particularly in my book too, the kind of keep it simple, stupid, the rule of kiss. I'm not someone that's all about like, you know, using 20 products, using the most expensive. I think if you have good skin, you don't need that much. It's about protecting, letting your skin do its job. And if you have a more complicated regimen, or if you like expected products, it's because it serves you in some way. And that may be in a way that has nothing to do with how much it works on your skin. It could be the packaging. It could be the aspirational purchase. It could be the smell or the texture. So it's and a more I, experiential, like emotional yeah. factor. It's not necessarily that you need four different hyaluronic acids. It's, yeah, absolutely. Okay, absolutely. It's serving another need. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of people who develop problem skin, they come to me because they're using too much. You know, the skin is a hide. It reacts to the environment. Um, and I think um, because the beauty industry, we had discussed this before, has become more and more experiential. You go into the now ex Barney's or the Nordstrom's or the Sephora's, they're trying to bring these experiential things in that we may not be able to do for a long time. Well, that's what I mean. It kind of, it breaks my heart a bit. I mean, maybe like, you know, I feel like I was like born in a department store. That's how I spent my weekends as like a teenager yeah. on like a young adult. And I look in the at mall? the last couple, in the mall, of course, in the mall? New Jersey, yeah, I I know. Mean, <laughs> you know, <laughs> for better or worse. Okay. Oh, yeah. So I, you know, it breaks my heart. I look at like Saks, Nordstrom, Neiman Marcus, these are yeah. all in the past two years in New York, in Manhattan. Yeah. They, you know, they've all put this money into building these experiential, beautiful stores. <laughs> what is going to happen? Like what, you need to rethink the entire model. Yeah, I don't think it's going to be great. I mean, I think online sales will get better and better, but I think traditionally online sales is more for a specific price category that benefits. Mm -hmm. right. you know, people, people will buy like a wallet or shoes or lipstick or products that they know well, but they may, not, they may not experiment online. They may not get the aspirational type of thing without the tactile. You know, right. it, really, it really depends. I, I expect online businesses to expand um, their profile in terms of service as well. 
They're mm-hmm. going to have to. There's going to have to be return. I mean, I don't know who's going to want to go into a department store. I'm going to want to go to a restaurant and a Broadway show before I go to the department. Yeah. And what do you see? Like, do you think that in terms of, in terms of like healthcare, you know, the focus right now is on the problem, but in yeah. terms of aesthetics and you know what we're seeing coming down the pipeline, yeah. what are you excited about? Well, I think first and foremost, people are going to come in for their quick fixes to make themselves feel good, and the injectables do that. I'm sure um, they're going to be like banging down your door as soon I, as. I hope so. Who knows? I mean, oddly, there are some people angry that they can't get in. I mean, it, people's uh, desire for vanity never seemed seem to amaze me. But um, what was I saying? Oh, so I think the quick fixes are going to come in first. You know, so much of the technology has been driven towards no downtime, younger targeted audiences. Mm-hmm. And I think that's so because, it, you know, three months ago, we didn't have time to pee. We didn't have, I mean, we we're just so like over We were so busy. We're all we're, so everyone's busy. Everyone's so busy. So, so much of the technology was driven to no downtime. Right. And that's fine because there's a lot of great technologies out there, but there's always a little bit of no pain and no gain in aesthetic surgery. Right. So, um, you know, those patients who like wanted that Fraxel laser, but they haven't been able to do it for two years. Guess what? People are going to have some more time on their hand. So I do think it's going to shift the way technology is driven. You know, and I, I also think there's going to be a consolidation of the aesthetic industry, because as you know, it's expanded so much into private equity, med spa, strip mall types of services. I'm not a huge fan of a lot of the med spas. As long as things are doctor supervised, there are people who are performing procedures that they're licensed to do and legal. There's no problem with but that. Can I, can I ask you a question about doctor supervised? Doctor supervised, I have to tell you, I don't always know what that means because yeah. there's no med spa that's going to open and say that they're not doctor supervised. But I always feel like that's kind of, um, and this is just my own opinion, this yeah. isn't like a leading question. I just feel like you don't necessarily know what that means. Like the doctor oh, yes. not be in the room. Yes, you do. You have to meet the doctor first. That's the law. In I have to meet days, the doctor first, say hello. You, you have and to then, meet the doctor, give them their, your, your concerns, have okay. him diagnose you. And then if he delegates something, he does it in front of you okay. or she does it in front of you. I see patients all day long and whether it's hair removal or light treatments like clear and brilliant microneedling, um, I meet the patient first. Mm-hmm. I tell them their options and I have nurses and PAs that perform those procedures right. so that I can focus on my more um, you know, aggressive type uh, skill set. But surely there are places where this is not happening. Like, I feel like I, you're telling me that, you know, this is what should happen in theory. It's performing illegally under the radar. That's really How it. How cheap is, like, too cheap? If, if, you're see, if you're seeing things for less than $500, you know, a bottle of Botox is 500, is 500 600 bucks. A syringe of filler could cost 300 bucks. Part of the thing I try and educate people in the book, there's a whole section on how to find your provider. Like, what are the tools you need to yeah. know? What, what do you need to educate yourself? Because there are different state laws. And listen, um, it's great that we have all these very easy treatments and it's made to seem all safe and easy, but they are medical procedures. And it is partly your responsibility to do a little bit of research. What do you think about like things like the makeup industry on brushes and going to the makeup counter and all that stuff? I think, you know, places like Sephora, Ulta, they, they're probably on calls right now having big conversations oh, yeah. about how they're going to retrain their people you know Not like 9 11 we all hem and hawed about the shoes yeah. and the taking off your jacket we got used to it and yeah. i'm going to tell you all everyone that's out there who is in the service industry or who's fearful of not having their livelihood back i'm going to tell you as a patient i'm going to tell you as a physician it, there's going to be a new normal but everyone's going to be okay because i do believe there's a, a light at the end of the tunnel I do believe eventually the testing is going to come out so that we're all going to feel like we know who's safe or not to be around. And I have really an enormous amount of faith in people's desire to be intimate with one another, to consume, um, and to find happiness. And whether we like it or not, whether it's a little blush or a little Botox, that's part of our cultural happiness. So to everyone out there, I feel very, very positive. It's just going to be work. Um, you know, we're just used to being intolerant of not having what we want when we like want it. that, yeah. Yeah, so I think if everyone's a little patient, we're going to get there. It'll be a different world, but it's going to be equally as great. And there'll be new opportunities for the people that are strong out there.
That's you always have a very positive attitude. You always yeah. have, you know, and I think that's been a huge part of your success. Negative, we know is not getting us anywhere, right? Yeah, 